the Afghanistan Jihad in the 1980s to oust the Soviet Union during the Cold War weaponizes Islam. Now, here were a lot of trained Mujahideen, trained in the art of warfare, trained in Pakistani madrasas. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. America is because they Muslims. It's given rise to jihadi groups that spread across Southeast Asia. But Jamaa Islamiya was a splinter of Darul Islam. When Darul Islam started sending people to Afghanistan, as Indonesia battles the rise of Islamic State ideology with guns on the battlefield. Setelah umat Islam bersatu, umat Islam punya hak tidak bisa didalimi oleh siapapun. Can progressive forces in the Muslim world disassociate from the narrative of terror? Jihad can only be officially declared by a government which is in power. In 1977, Rawalpindi. General Zia ul Haq, the Pakistani army chief, overthrows the democratic government in a bloodless coup d'etat. Zia, as a person, wasn't very charismatic. Uh, he did not have any vision for Pakistan. And then he used Islam, because uh, these military dictators in Pakistan uh, did not have the, that credibility, or they did not have that political legitimacy. He had to do those steps which reinforce that impression that he is taking those steps to Islamize Pakistan. Hudud ordinance was one of them, and it had a very radicalizing impact on the society. Zia initiates the Hudud ordinances, replacing British era rules with Islamic laws in the constitution. Punishments such as lashes, amputations, and stoning to death are introduced. Pakistan's Islamization coincides with Ruhollah Khomeini's Islamic revolution in Iran. It emboldens the Muslim right wing in South Asia. During these turbulent times, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan in 1979. A Cold War battle between communism and capitalism intensifies. The US administration and Saudi Arabia join hands to sponsor a proxy war in Afghanistan to defeat the invading Soviet army. The war is presented as an Islamic Jihad, a battle between Islam and communism. There was this nexus or a convergence of interest between the Saudi monarchy and the Wahhabi clergy establishment to promote and export Wahhabi Islam to South Asia. Not only that Wahhabi Islam spread, uh, but its influence also increased in this part of the world. Islam is weaponized through the printing of books like the Alphabet of Jihad Literacy. Funded by the CIA, these jihadi books are published by the University of Nebraska and then smuggled across Pakistan and Afghanistan. Taliban, 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 
New madrasas like the Jamia Haqqaniya are propped up across Pakistan by Saudi funds. Their purpose is to serve the Afghanistan Jihad as the ideological base to spread a weaponized version of Islam. The resort to violence is subject to a lot of conditions. Jihad can only be officially declared by a government which is in power. Similarly, jihad can only be waged against an enemy who has come into your territory. And that was the essence of the jihad against the Soviet Union. Foreigners from across the globe are invited to Pakistan in their thousands to fight Soviet Russia. They receive training from the Pakistan army and are named the Mujahideen or Alas fighters. They are sent across the mountainous border into Afghanistan to begin the fight to oust the Soviet Union from the country. Now, here were a lot of trained Mujahideen, trained in the art of warfare, trained in Pakistani madrasas, and Pakistan saw this as a way of extending its influence into Afghanistan. Backed by American guns and Stinger missiles, the Mujahideen unleashed guerrilla attacks, neutralizing Soviet ground and air power. More than 14,000 Soviet soldiers die in fighting that lasts a decade. The Red Army finally withdraws from Afghanistan in 1989, leaving armed Mujahideen factions in control of Afghanistan. There is some concern about what we call stockpiling. And it would not be fair to have a tremendous amount of lethal supplies left behind. Radical Mujahideen fighters in Afghanistan morph into a political force calling themselves the Taliban. They decide to govern Afghanistan through a weaponized version of Sharia law. Music is banned in the country. The growing of Islamic beards is made compulsory. Women are barred from leaving their homes without a male guardian. Many local sectarian and the global jihadist organizations have developed their nexus and somehow has uh, expanded their outreach in many uh, areas of the countries. It is linked with this, the rise of the pan-Islamism and uh, the brotherhood movements all across the world. Ignored and unrecognized by the world, some radical Mujahideen fighters now aimed for a global supremacy of Islam. Saudi Mujahideen fighter Osama bin Laden leads this violent jihad who forms Al-Qaeda, a small yet powerful terror group in Afghanistan. Bin Laden plots, plans and executes the hijacking of planes in America that crash and kill thousands at the World Trade Center in 2001. the United States invades Afghanistan to defeat the same Islamist government they had helped create. The same jihad is now viewed by the Taliban as a battle between Islam and Christianity. The jihadi infrastructure built in Pakistan during the Soviet jihad continues to supply radical fighters to aid the Taliban fight the US army across the porous border in Afghanistan. Pakistan, in a sense, became a prisoner of its own dichotomous and contradictory conflicted policies. Because once the Soviet Russia was defeated and Americans left, Pakistan had genuine grievances vis-a-vis -vis being left alone because there was no plan to dismantle these groups or no policy what to do about them. Darul Ulum Haqqaniya in Akora Khatak is the leading jihadi seminary that's been operating freely with government backing for over 40 years. It's dubbed the University of Jihad 
for being the ideological birthplace of the Taliban and political Islam. Freedom fighters were like Salman Haqqani is the vice chancellor of the madrasa. Salman is continuing his father's legacy of defeating foreign invasions in Afghanistan through armed jihad. America is Muslims Despite Pakistan's frontline role in the war on terror, the Talibanization of the country on ideological lines continues from within. At least six ministers in the Taliban's interim cabinet for Afghanistan studied here at the Jamia Haqqaniya. Salman's connections with the Afghan Taliban run deep. The University of Jihad's most prominent graduate is Mullah Omar, the late Amir and the leader of the Taliban. The Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan after a 20-year war on terror was celebrated in the madrasa as a victory of Islam over the West. Many Afghans influenced by the Taliban arrive here to study a weaponized version of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Che zikr karda ahadith. Dagi sirf aw sirf pa wajib al amal ke do bandi ittifaq. The Jamia Haqqaniya's boarding school houses 4,000 students from Pakistan and Afghanistan. They are fed, clothed, and educated for free. Students here learn a conservative version of Islam. Muhammad Ahmed is 11 and has lived at the madrasa for many of those years. Madrasas like the University of Jihad have sympathizers in power who fund and support their cause. This narrative of jihad has spread to many parts of the Muslim world. Ketika saya bersama dengan mujahidin, ya, bersama mujahidin Afghanistan, khususnya dari Tanzim Ittihad Islami, ada tujuh organisasi yang bergerak pada saat itu. The Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan has alarm bells ringing in Southeast Asia. Seven Indonesian ISIS fighters are freed by the Taliban. It's raised fears of renewed attacks in the country. Indonesians have been joining the jihad in Afghanistan that dates back three decades. That's when former terrorist Nasir Abbas traveled to Pakistan to fight Soviet Russia. Ketika tahun 87, umur saya 18 tahun, saya terbang pergi ke 
Pakistan ya nah dari Pakistan sini dari Karachi Karachi kemudian naik bis pergi ke Peshawar dari Peshawar terus sampai ke perbatasan nah di, di, di dekat Afghanistan setelah saya lulus di Akademi Militer pada akhir tahun 1990 ya lalu kemudian saya dilantik untuk menjadi instruktur di Akademi Militer Mujahidin Afghanistan saya menjabat sebagai instruktur selama tiga tahun saya melatih Uh, dari orang Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Filipina, ya termasuk juga ada orang uh, Arab yang kemudian saya latih juga di Akademi Militer Mujahidin Afghanistan. Pada tahun 92, Mujahidin sudah berhasil merebut Kabul dan membentuk uh, suatu negara baru. As the Afghan jihad with Soviet Russia came to a close, Nasir traveled back to form Jama Islamiyah. Jamaat Islamiyah was a splinter of Dar al Islam. And when Dar al Islam started sending people to Afghanistan to basically get training to come back and fight the Suharto government, then Abu Bakar Ba'ashir started to continue to lead the movement. In the period after the Al Qaeda fatwa in 1998, a group within JI made contact with and established good relations with Al-Qaeda. Abu Bakr al-Bashir pledged allegiance to Osama bin Laden. The Afghan Jihad narrative of a war between Islam against Christianity is now brought to Indonesia. Bashir sought revenge from those invading Afghanistan after 9-11. On the 12th of October 2002, he masterminded a jihadi attack on Kuta Beach in Bali. The attack killed 202 people, including 88 Australians, to send a message to the invading Australian army in Afghanistan. Many JI members were eventually arrested, convicted and sentenced. But the weaponized version of Islam continued to spread across Indonesia into multiple splinter groups. It is now being fought with guns in difficult to access terrains such as Sulawesi. Indonesia's security agencies conduct routine counter-terrorism operations like these to stop the rise of Islamist violence. Today, their battle is against the East Indonesia Mujahideen, hiding and operating from the jungles of Sulawesi. The group wants to establish an Islamic state that mirrors the one established by ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Sulawesi has long been mired in communal violence between local Christians and Muslims. The Jemaah Islamia capitalized on this and used the ensuing conflict for their own ends. What that fighting did was to enable Indonesians associated with Jemaah Islamia, with JI, to basically translate the idea of an international Zionist Christian alliance as spelled out in the 1998 fatwa and apply it to Indonesia and tell other Indonesians that, look, Muslims are dying at Christian hands in Indonesia, and therefore we need you to defend uh, Islam. And that became the single biggest recruiting argument that any extremist group has ever had. More than 1,000 people were killed after Muslims and Christians began fighting between 1998 and 2001 in Sulawesi. At least 25 churches and 18 mosques were damaged or destroyed. The Molino Declaration, a peace treaty to end the communal conflict, was signed in 2001.
Indonesia has a history of separatist movements calling for the establishment of Sharia law. The Aceh Freedom Movement erupted in the 1970s to gain provincial autonomy from Indonesia. Sharia law was finally implemented as a solution to Aceh's freedom movement. Sharia law was welcomed in far-flung pesantrens or Islamic boarding schools like these. Tengu Muslim Atahiri has been running the Darul Mujahideen boarding school for the last 12 years. He's a member of the Islamic Defenders Front, a far-right, hardline group. Orang Aceh dulu paling anti terhadap Pancasila dulu. Banyak orang yang ngeri tentang khilafah Islam ya. Seolah-olah khilafah itu bertentangan dengan Pancasila. Seolah-olah khilafah itu bertentangan dengan NKRI. Padahal khilafah itu kan persatuan. Jadi bersemua negara-negara Islam bersatu di bawah payung khilafah. During the 2004 tsunami, the Islamic Defenders Front won the hearts and minds of locals by providing relief to people in distress. Kalau jenazah waktu itu mayat-mayat waktu itu sudah berserakan di mana-mana bahkan ada fatwa dari tokoh nasional atau semacam statement dari tokoh nasional yang yang mengatakan mayat uh, tsunami sudah bisa dibakar karena menyebarkan virus membahayakan. Tapi FVI tanpa peduli turun ke lokasi tsunami itu bisa mbak lihat sendiri atau saudara kita lihat sendiri bagaimana Habib Ridik mengambil mayat bagaimana saudara-saudara kita di FVI mengambil mayat sehingga orang Aceh waktu itulah melihat bahwa FVI ini betul-betul ahli sunnah wal jamaah The Islamist group then aimed to correct what it saw as the errors of Indonesia's 1945 constitution that established a secular state and religious freedom. Setelah umat Islam bersatu, umat Islam punya hak tidak bisa didalimi oleh siapapun, tidak bisa dijajah oleh siapapun. Itu yang 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 sebenarnya diinginkan oleh umat Islam. Bayangkan seandainya negara Islam bersatu. Suara kita di Uyghur, Muslim di Uyghur tidak, tidak bisa di, dibuat seperti itu kan, karena ada khalifah yang mengatur, ada khalifah yang yang memberikan teguran kepada saudara kita apa kepada pemimpin Cina jangan macam-macam dengan saudara kami kalau kalian macam-macam dengan saudara kami kami boikot produk kalian. Pada dasarnya itu FPI itu seperti itu jadi. Watak dasarnya adalah destruktif, gitu, uncivil. Nggak bisa itu sesuatu yang bukan hanya utopia, more than utopia. Jadi nggak, nggak ada argumentasinya lah menurut saya. Jadi khilafah dalam pengertian tadi itu sebenarnya nggak bisa dipertentangan dengan apa, dengan Pancasila. Ya kalau mau dipertentangan Pancasila, khilafahnya dia, gitu. Bukan khilafah dalam arti umum. Jadi dia memberi arti kepada terhadap khilafah itu bertentangan dengan Pancasila. There has been rising intolerance in Aceh against Christians who make up just 1% of the population. More than 10 churches have been closed in Aceh in the last few years alone. Hanya orang non muslim yang boleh tidak mematuhi kanun-kanun atau apa yang disebut dengan perda-perda syariah misalnya. Nah, Dimulai dari pidana kalau di sini kan pidana Islam terus pelan-pelan sekarang sudah masuk ke lembaga keuangan syariah nanti masuk lagi ke bidang-bidang yang lain seperti pemerintahan pendidikan dan lain-lain. Nah bagi FPI ini model yang paling sempurna untuk Indonesia Jadi, artinya FPI ingin scaling up. Bagaimana model Aceh ini bisa berlaku di semua bagian dari Indonesia? In the suburb of Bekasi, Agus is desperately trying to reopen his Philadelphia church. It was sealed off a decade ago after protests and cases of alleged assault against its members, primarily from the Islamic Defenders Front. 
yang diminta tadi SKB 60 jiwa kita dapat 257 kurang lebih. Namun setelah oknum-oknum EP ini datang ke lokasi, mereka kan juga semakin berani gitu kan, kan semakin beringas. Ya, terakhir kuncinya di apa? Terakhir di tanggal 24 itu. Di situ memang makanya saya bilang tadi mencekam. Lampu pun tiba-tiba yang dijalani dimatiin semua. Ya, puji Tuhan untung nggak terjadi ada pembunuhan gitu kan. Menakutkan gitu kan. Courts ruled in favor of the church and ordered the administration to revoke the decree. But the church remains unopened and in rubble. Pemda Bekasi saat itu melalui kuasa hukumnya justru banding ke pengadilan tinggi Tata Usaha Jakarta. Namun Pemda Bekasi tidak kunjung mencabut dan tidak mengendahkan perintah pengadilan tersebut. Jemparin, maaf, tai kebo pun ada. Kemudian air comberan, telur busuk, bahkan hujatan-hujatan yang sangat menyakitkan. Yang tidak semestinya mungkin, mestinya menurut saya, orang mau lakukan ibadah harus dapat cacian seperti itu. The Islamic Defenders Front made global headlines in 2017 when Jakarta's mayor was accused of blasphemy. Two thousand and sixteen, Jakarta. Thousands of hardline Islamic protesters descend upon the nation's capital. Their demand to arrest the governor of Jakarta, Basuki Ahok Tahaja Purnama, for blasphemy. An ethnic Chinese Christian, he is accused of misquoting a Quranic verse in an election rally. As days pass, more than 200,000 members of the Islamic Defenders Front gather from various parts of the country. They're led by Rizik Shihab, a vocal critic of Indonesia's democracy who wants to impose Sharia law. Karena FPI itu kemudian memilih posisi yang sangat tegas dalam melawan pemerintah dengan orasi-orasi politik Habib Rizik, itu orang Aceh melihat seperti ada suara-suara mereka yang diwakilkan oleh Habib Rizik atau FPI di Jakarta. The police struggle to contain the crowds as passions turn into anger. Under pressure from the mob, a hawk is arrested and tried by the Joko Widodo government. After a lengthy trial, he is convicted of blasphemy and jailed. It marks a watershed moment in the country's political history. The verdict is no surprise. Blasphemy cases have a 100% conviction rate in Indonesia. Tengo Muslim Atahiri was present on the occasion. Jadi saya rasa uh, bukan cuma karena melawan satu orang, tapi karena FVI menegakkan keadilan, kemudian uh, termasuk kerja keras Habib Ridik bersama kawan-kawan di FVI berhasil menyeret uh, penista agama Ahok ke pengadilan, itu semakin bertambah cinta masyarakat Aceh terhadap FVI dan Habib Rizik. Nah, sebenarnya dari awal uh, FVI sudah dicintai, cuma semakin bertambah rasa cinta. Emboldened by the court's ruling, Rizik pledges allegiance to ISIS. He calls his followers to support the jihad in Syria, Iraq, Palestine, and other oppressed Muslim countries. On the 30th of December 2020, the Indonesian government issues a joint ministerial decree banning the Islamic Defenders Front. The government says IDF had threatened Indonesia's national ideology. After the ban, the political group morphs into the Islamic Unity Front. 
azab Allah di akhirat kita akan diberikan oleh Allah syurga yang jannatun na'im Tengu Muslim Atahiri continues to spread his weaponized version of Islam in Aceh This while minorities in other Muslim majority countries succumb to the impact of blasphemy laws In 2010, protests erupt across Pakistan when a Christian farmer by the name of Asya Bibi is accused of blasphemy. She's convicted in a lengthy trial and sentenced to death. Once you are arrested for blasphemy charges, then you will end up in jail for years because no judge, given the kind of religious sensitivity which is involved with the issue of blasphemy, could dare acquit the blasphemy uh, 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 victims. Governor of Punjab uh, from PPP, Salman Tasri, he, he stood up for uh, her rights to, uh, you know, bail, and he questioned the procedural uh, uh, lacunae in the blasphemy laws, which could be used by anyone for personal vendettas. <laughs> The Punjab governor is assassinated by his own security guard, Mumtaz Qadri. When Mumtaz Qadri did this, was arrested, he overnight became hero of Brailvis, section of radical Brailvis in the community, the, the wider community. Eventually, he was hanged in 2016, and that had a very radicalizing impact on a wider movement which sprouted uh, during Qadri's incarceration. Asya Bibi is finally freed in 2019 after charges against her are proven to be false. The case inspires the formation of a political party. The Tariq el a far-right Islamic group that banks on votes from supporters of the blasphemy law. Taj Muhammad Khan actively advocates for the murder of anyone who blasphemes against Prophet Muhammad. He believes if such harsh punishments are not implemented by the state, his supporters would implement those punishments themselves. The price of the weaponization of Pakistan's blasphemy laws continues to be paid by the minorities of the country. Since 1987, hundreds of Christians were charged under the blasphemy laws, with a significant spike in 2020 when 200 cases were registered. The majority of Pakistan's Christians live in the province of Punjab. It's home to Akmal Bhatti, a Christian activist who's trying to stop the misuse of Islam against minority religions in Pakistan. He heads the Minority Alliance Pakistan from his village Kushpur. It's known as the Little Rome of Pakistan for being the biggest Catholic village of the country. Religion ki buniyad pe cheezon ko akatha nahi rakha ja sakta. Religion ko hukumranon ne hamesha tool ke taur pe istemal kiya hai. Severity nahi thi, isni sangini nahi thi, lekin zia ke daur mein isme amendment leke aaye gaye. 259 B ko shamil kiya gaya. Discretion of Holy Quran aur uski saza umar ke ad rakhi gayi. Phir 259 C banaya gaya, jiski Rasool-e Paak ki shaan mein agar koi is tarah ke gusta khana alfaz koi shak istemal karta hai, to uspe 259 C lagu kiya gaya. मैं समझता हूं कि ये बहुत इसको एक जो इंतहाब संद है उनके हाथ में एक टूल दे दिया गया Today Akmal has organized a meeting seeking to gain support to counter the radical message of local extremists उसमें जिन्होंने बदामी बाग 
جوزف کلونی جلائی تھی عدالت یہ کہتی ہے میں نہیں کہتا عدالت یہ کہتی ہے کہ وہ لوگوں نے زمین پہ قبضہ کرنے کے لیے یہ الزام لگایا کہ ان مسیحیوں نے تو ہی نے قرآن کی ہے اس لیے ہماری وہ لوگوں کے گھر جلائے گئے تاکہ یہ کلونی چھوڑ کے چلے جائیں اور اس پہ قبضہ کر لیا جائے Rising extremism has created new issues for Christians in the country. Every year, 1,000 girls belonging to various religious minorities are targeted and converted to Islam. 15-year-old Mehek is a Christian girl who was kidnapped by a Muslim boy from her home two years ago. تب جب مجھے شاہد علی نے اغوا کیا تھا میری عمر ساڑھے تیرہ سال تھی اپنے پاس رکھا ہے اور تین ماں مجھے اپنے پاس رکھ کے مجھے میرے ساتھ زبردستی جنا کاری اور حرام کاری کرتا رہا مجھ سے جب مجھے اس کو پتہ چلا کہ میری ماما پاپا کو پتہ چلا کہ میرے بھی ماما پاپا نے پرچہ درج کروایا پھر اسے پتہ چلا کہ اس کے ماما پاپا نے اسے پرچہ درج پھر اس نے زبردستی نظر تبدیل کروایا پھر مجھ سے زبردستی نے کہا وہ پیپروں پہ انگوٹھے سائن کروائے میں تمہیں بھی مار دوں گا تمہارے ماں باپ کو بھی مار دوں گا تمہارے پورے بہن خاندان کو مار دوں گا کہ جو نے کچھ بھی کرنے کی کوشش کی That's when Akmal filed a case and eventually the police raided the home to recover Mehik. A few months later, Mehek gave birth to a child. When my son was born, I put his name to Yerish. So then, when he was born, he was born in the hospital for the child. He was born in the hospital for the child. He was born in the hospital for the child. He was born in the hospital. اسٹاف کٹھی ہوئی تو ہم نے اسے پھر ہم نے اس کے اوپر پرچہ درج کروایا وہاں پہ بھی اس کی ضمانت ہو چکی There is no law in Pakistan that declares the forceful conversion of someone's religion to Islam as illegal Girls like Mehek routinely fall victim to these shortcomings in the country's legal system Akmal had tabled a bill in parliament to stop the conversion of adolescent Christian girls to Islam. We want that this is a forced conversion. This is a very sanguine matter. There are small children. So they should be forced to it. So the draft is very good. But they told us that the religious religious ulama hazarat they want to determine that age is not to determine the age. The anti-forced conversion bill was eventually rejected by the Ministry of Religious Affairs. It declared any legal impediments to entering the fold of Islam as un-Islamic. The struggle for religious tolerance in Pakistan continues. In Minhaj al-Quran, we think that the best lessons of anti-terrorism, the best lessons of anti-extremism, and the best lessons of tolerance can be taught by the mothers at a very young and tender age. Rising religious fundamentalism could snowball into conflict in the world's most populous Muslim-majority nation. The rise of ISIS and cyber radicalization has reinforced moves to reform Islamic boarding schools in Indonesia. The country is home to more than 14,000 Pasantrans, or Islamic boarding schools. Pasantrans in Java are also patrons of local culture. They nurture Islamic discourse specific to Java, and they preserve the Arabic Jawi tradition. Since Islamic State increasingly targets children, counter-terror classes have gained importance. Ini film yang yang pertama judulnya Hijrah Nisa. Isu hijrah memang sangat sangat banyak terjadi di Indonesia akhir-akhir yang mungkin dibaca di sosial media, baik itu di Instagram maupun sosial media yang lain lah, WhatsApp dan Facebook. Problem seperti ini. Jadi bahwa 
Mohammed Wilden is a professor of Islamic studies in Yogyakarta and strives to maintain Indonesia's moderate character. He wants to stop the misinterpretation of Hidra, the migration of Muslims to a foreign land to help fellow Muslims in need. The Islamic State misuses this concept to attract fighters to Syria. Today, Wilden is screening an animation to help clear misconceptions. Countering violent jihad means going back to the pluralistic roots of Islam in the subcontinent. The majority in Pakistan follow the moderate Sufi version of Islam, a belief in saints, veneration of their shrines, and forming bonds between worshippers. A mystic romanticism spread by Muslim intellectuals of the subcontinent over the last 1,000 years. Sufism delinks the religion from its political use in the country. Sufiyah Kiram ne Pako Hind me bahut khidmat pesh ki hain aur Islam in is bare sagir me phela hi inki badalat hai aur Sufiyah ka jo maslak hai jo unki talimat hain wo kisi bhi shiddat pasandi aur yani extremism ke haq me nahi hain wo insaniyat ka parchar karti hai aur har maktab e fikr ke admi se chahe wo kisi mazhab se bhi talaq rakhta ho. उसको अपनाती है उसकी इज्जत करती है और यही फर्क है कि सूफिया ने अपने हुस्न ए اخلاق के जरिए बड़े सगीर में इस्लाम की तरवीज की और उससे कामयाब बनाया सूफी इस्लाम इज बीइंग मेनस्ट्रीमड थ्रू एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट्स लाइक द मिनहाज उल कुरान इन लाहौर Horam Gandapur heads it in Pakistan, promoting an inclusive version of Islam. We should move away from the concept of madrasas where we are only teaching uh, Islamic studies and people do not get the necessary skills to be employable in the mar modern marketplace. This is the College of Sharia and Islamic Sciences. Uh, Major Muhammad Khan Saab is the principal of the College of Sharia and uh, uh, this is his staff. We'll go to his office. To our next topic, I would like to repeat our previous lecture. And the Minhaj has branches in 93 countries. It regularly initiates interfaith dialogues with religious minorities in Pakistan. Scientific education also forms the bedrock of Minhaj al Quran's philosophy. We prepare our students for competing at international language so that we co they communicate the message of Islam to people who are Muslim and non-Muslim to the world. And also because, you know, in this era, Islam, which is, uh, is face has been blackened in the world. So our purpose is to prepare scholars so that they might uh, preach people, they might talk about Islam, they might clear its face from all type of uh, blames which are put on Islam. A university for women has been set up by Minhaj al-Quran with a completely different message from the ultra-conservative Islam in Afghanistan. In Minhaj al-Quran, we think that the best lessons of anti-terrorism, the best lessons of anti-extremism, and the best lessons of tolerance 
can be taught by the mothers at a very young and tender age. Minhaj ul Quran has made a concerted effort in redefining the narrative revolving around armed jihad. When we talk of jihad, there is jihad bin nafs, which is the fight against the baser self of human beings, of mankind. Then there is jihad bil mal, which is uh, by the spending of your worldly things for the welfare and betterment of the people. And then there is the jihad bil kital, which is the resort to violence. Now, the resort to violence is subject to a lot of conditions. Jihad can only be officially declared by a government which is in power. The Institute stands as a mitigating force against the growing radicalism outside the campus walls. It also routinely conducts counter-terror camps in universities and schools in the country. Minhaj al-Quran authored a 600-page fatwa, or religious edict, denouncing terrorism and suicide bombings. The Institute takes pride in countering the misrepresentations of Islam. Quran-e Paak ki kisi ayat ko lekar usko apna nukta-e nazar pehna kar is tarah se pesh karenge jaise khud ko shamle jaiz hai jaise Islam ke naam par apni marzi se talwar utha kar apni marzi se decide karna ke sach kya hai galat kya hai aur agar dusra na mane to usko qatl kar dena Islami nukta nazar se jaiz hai ye haram ko halal mein convert karne ka jo process hai ye extremism aur terrorism ki buniyad hai basics hai as a reformist movement takes root in the Muslim world, Prime Minister Imran Khan is responding with increasing religious tourism in Pakistan. His government renovated and restored the 15th century Gurdwara Kartarpur Sahib in Punjab, one of the holiest Sikh places of worship. The Kartarpur corridor gives visa-free access to Sikhs from India to visit Pakistan. It's also an effort to heal the religious scars of partition and animosity between Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. Such interfaith initiatives by the Pakistani government are having a marked impact on the country's Islamic politics. In 2018, three Hindu candidates were elected from Muslim-majority areas in Pakistan's Sindh province. The win resulted in celebrations across the Hindu community in Pakistan. All three candidates won from the general seats for the first time ever in the history of the country. Hindus form the biggest minority community in Pakistan, with more than 9 million living in the country. The electoral victory for Hindus has given hope of greater representation of minority voices in Pakistani politics. It's one way to reduce the impact of politics done in the name of Islam. The victory also gives hope for further policy changes in Pakistan's legal system that can help resolve interfaith issues in the country. It can serve as a watershed moment to curb the rise of weaponized Islam, not just in Pakistan, but in many parts of the Islamic world. <laughs>